Laudator Jesus Christus, Vatican and World News. Today, Sunday, April 11th, is the octave of Easter, also known as Low Sunday or Quasimodo Sunday, and observed as the Feast of Divine Mercy. And these are today's headlines. Pope Francis celebrates Mass in the Church of Santo Spirito in Sassia, the Sanctuary of Divine Mercy here in Rome. Fighting intensifies in the Marib region of Yemen with increasing numbers of casualties. And citizens head to the polls in Ecuador to vote in the second runoff in the nation's presidential election. In the Vatican, I'm Christopher Wells. Sunday, the octave day of Easter, is also observed as the Feast of Divine Mercy. Pope Francis marked the day with a Mass celebrated at the 16th century Church of Santo Spirito in Sassia, close to the Vatican, which is the official Divine Mercy Church in Rome. The Holy Father delivered a homily urging Christians to open themselves to Christ's mercy and, in turn, to share it with others. Robin Gomes has more. Lasciamoci risuscitare dalla pace, dal perdono e dalle piaghe di Gesù misericordioso. Let us be renewed by the peace, forgiveness and wounds of the merciful Jesus. Let us ask for the grace to become witnesses of mercy. Only in this way will we proclaim the gospel of God, which is the gospel of mercy. This is the exhortation that Pope Francis offered in his homily at Mass on Divine Mercy Sunday. He explained how with mercy the risen Christ brings about the resurrection of the disciples and changes their lives. They received mercy from him through the three gifts of peace, forgiveness through the Holy Spirit and his wounds, the Pope said. The Pope said, Jesus does not bring a peace that removes the problems without, but one that infuses trust within. La pace di Gesù suscita infatti la missione. Non è tranquillità, non è comodità. The peace of Jesus that awakens mission, the Pope explained, entails not ease and comfort, but the challenge to break out of ourselves from a paralyzing absorption and from the bonds that keep the heart imprisoned. The second way Jesus shows us mercy is by bestowing the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. By ourselves, he said, we cannot remove sin and its guilt. Only God takes it away. Only he, by his mercy, can make us emerge from the depths of our misery. Hence, we need to let ourselves be forgiven. Forgiveness in the Holy Spirit is the Easter gift that enables our interior resurrection, the Pope said, urging Christians to ask for the grace to embrace the sacrament of forgiveness. Lastly, Jesus heals us with mercy by making our wounds his own and by bearing our weaknesses in his own body, the Pope said. Le piaghe sono le vie che Dio ci ha spalancato perché noi entriamo. The wounds of Jesus, he said, are pathways that God has opened for us to enter into his tender love and actually touch who he is. This, the Pope said, happens at every Mass where Jesus offers us his wounded and risen body. The grace of receiving mercy, he said, is the starting point of our Christian journey. Having received mercy, let us now become merciful, he urged. I am Robin Gomes. Following the Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday, Pope Francis led the faithful in the recitation of the Regina Celi. Ahead of the Marian prayer, he greeted those taking part in the Mass through the various forms of media. The Holy Father also offered special greetings to those present in the Church, including the regular faithful, nurses, inmates, people with disabilities, refugees and migrants, civil protection volunteers, and members of the Hospitaller Sisters of Mercy. You represent some of the situations in which mercy is made tangible, the Pope said. It becomes closeness, service, care for those in difficulty. Returning to a theme introduced in his homily during the Mass, Pope Francis said, I hope that you will always feel you have been granted mercy so as to be merciful to others in turn. He concluded his brief remarks with the prayer, May the Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, obtain this grace for all of us.
Turning now to world news, the fight for control over the strategic region of Marib is continuing in Yemen, with many casualties being reported. Nathan Morley has the latest. According to reports, fighting for the key Yemeni region of Marib has now intensified with 53 pro-government and Houthi rebel fighters killed in the past day alone. The Houthis have been trying to seize the oil-rich Marib area, which is the government's last significant pocket of territory in the north. They've been battling since February this year. In a separate development, Yemen's Houthi rebels also claimed two drone attacks on a Saudi air base in southern Saudi Arabia. A rebel spokesman said the attacks targeted locations in the city of Karmis Mushait. The spokesman said the attacks were in retaliation for Saudi-led coalition attacks in Yemen. Separately, the German government has expressed deep concern over the ongoing humanitarian situation in Yemen ahead of next week's high-profile international meeting in Berlin, which is aimed at restoring a comprehensive ceasefire in the war-torn country. Now, with COVID-19 spreading rapidly, Yemen is facing an emergency within an emergency. Sanitation and clean water are in short supply. Only half of the health facilities are functioning, and many that remain operational lack basic equipment like masks and gloves, let alone oxygen and other essential supplies. Yemen has been beset by violence and chaos since 2014, when Houthi rebels overran much of the country, including the capital Sana'a. The crisis escalated in 2015, when the Saudi-led coalition launched a devastating air campaign aimed at rolling back Houthi territorial gains. According to UN estimates, the conflict in Yemen has so far claimed the lives of at least 233,000 people, with millions more facing facing starvation and in need of humanitarian assistance. In one rare piece of good news, however, Yemeni authorities have reopened the country's third biggest airport after a halt of nearly five years. A domestic flight from the state carrier Yemen Airways marked the reopening of the Riyan International Airport. For Vatican Radio, this is Nathan Morley reporting. From the Americas, Ecuadorians go to the polls on Sunday for the second round runoff of their presidential election amidst an economic downturn and the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic, with tensions continuing to run high. James Blears has this report. Polls predict a close runoff between leftist economist Andres Arauz, who wants more state control, and Guillermo Lasso, a conservative banker contesting the top job for the third time, who favours a free market economy. In round one on February the 7th, neither gained the necessary 40% to win outright. Arauz gained 32.74%, while Lasso got 19.74%. Hot on his heels was indigenous candidate Yaku Perez, who gained 19.39%, claiming fraud and demanding a recount in 17 of the country's 24 provinces, but the National Electoral Council declined this. He's refusing to endorse either of the remaining two. Lasso's side claims his rival wants to move Ecuador towards socialism, Venezuelan style, and scrap the dollar currency, creating a new one. Aruz denies this and assures he wants to strengthen both the economy and the dollar. Arauz is the protege of former President Rafael Correa, who was convicted of corruption and sentenced in his absence to eight years jail. Correa is in exile in Belgium. The economy has been dented by a slump in oil prices and it's considerably worsened with the pandemic. Only 1% of the population has been vaccinated. There are more than 300,000 cases of COVID and 12,000 deaths. A declared state of exception restricts vehicles circulation via a number plate system. Alcohol sales are curbed, parks and beaches are closed, there's a nightly curfew and the electoral authority is encased by barbed wire and ringed by armoured vehicles. Whoever wins will be inaugurated on May the 24th. For Vatican Radio, James Blues reporting. April is shaping up to be Brazil's darkest month yet in the pandemic, with hospitals struggling with a crush of patients 
deaths on track for record highs and few signs of a reprieve from a troubled vaccination program in the Latin American nation. The health ministry has cut its outlook for vaccine supplies in April three times already to half their initial level, and the country's two biggest laboratories are facing supply constraints. The delays could lead to tens of thousands more deaths as the particularly contagious P1 variant of COVID-19 sweeps Brazil. Meanwhile, the United Nations World Health Organization has expressed concern about severe shortages of coronavirus vaccines in impoverished nations. As Stefan Boss reports, dozens of countries may not be able to administer complete vaccination to patients. The head of the World Health Organization, or WHO, is furious about what he calls the shocking imbalance in global COVID-19 vaccinations. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said that while one in four people in rich countries received a vaccine, only one in 500 people in poor nations got a dose. He complains that most available vaccines are sent to wealthy nations. More than 700 million vaccine doses have been administered globally, but over 87 percent have gone to high income or upper middle income countries while low-income countries have received just 0.2 percent. The vaccine alliance Gavi shares his concerns. It has revealed that in at least 60 countries, the coronavirus vaccination program may be stalled after the first shots have been administered. The expected delivery of second doses in the 12-week window currently recommended is in doubt, especially in the world's poorest nations. That's because nearly all deliveries through the global program intended to help them are blocked until as late as June. The vaccine shortage stems mainly from India's decision to stop exporting vaccines from its Serum Institute factory as it is facing scarcity of its own. India produces the overwhelming majority of the AstraZeneca doses. That vaccine is used by COVAX, a global initiative in providing coronavirus jabs to less fortunate countries. Another problem is that COVAX will only ship vaccines cleared by the World Health Organization. The WHO admitted that the link between an AstraZeneca shot and rare blood clots also complicated deliveries. It said that it wants to speed up reviewing additional production from China and Russia. The European Union has not approved Chinese and Russian vaccines to hold the coronavirus pandemic, but hard-hit EU nation Hungary is already using them. For Vatican Radio, I am Stefan Bos, reporting. And that brings us just about to the end of this edition of Vatican and World News. For more on these and other issues, we can invite you to visit our web portal at www.vaticannews.va, where you can get all of the latest headlines, as well as links to full texts of documents and links to our YouTube page, where you can watch papal events throughout the week. You can also follow us on Facebook and on Twitter with our Vatican News English accounts. My thanks this afternoon to our producers and technicians in studio. In the Vatican, I'm Christopher Wells.